Hi, and welcome to our broadcast. I'm Dr. Patrick McInerney, uh, CEO and owner of Northern Illinois Foot and Ankle Specialists. Uh, I'm uh, double board certified by the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgery. And I'm here today uh, having a discussion with uh, Dr. Wade Daba. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, how's it going? Um, my name is Wajdi Daba. I'm a board certified anesthesiologist and pain management doctor in Chicago, pain therapy associates in Schaumburg. Um, I'm excited about today's conversation. Um, I think we have some really good topics that a lot of people are gonna find interesting. Great, well, I'm gonna start off the conversation um, you know, with uh, something that's pretty common with people. Um, you know, people uh, come into my office a lot, and I'm sure your office too, with you know, numbness, burning, tingling, shooting pain in their legs. Um, and when they do, um, you know, they often feel like it's, it's leg pain or foot pain. And in my experience, I find out that sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, what's your experience, Dr. Dow? Um, I'm going to kind of go off most of that question that, that you talked about. I think I may have missed the last couple of seconds, but um, basically uh, to kind of touch base, a lot of, like most pain syndromes, um, at least from my standpoint, the majority of the, the questions as to what's going on, what's going on is actually um, very easily told by the story of, of their history, right? So um, when we're trying to decipher whether pain is truly coming from the foot versus whether it may be a component of low back pain, which, which people will be very surprised sometimes the only um, symptom of that is actually foot and ankle pain, but a lot of it comes down to the history of you know, when, how long has this been going on? Um, has the patient had prior surgeries to the back or to, or to the foot? Um, is this something that is, that is present all the time? Or is it more, um, more prevalent when they're walking, when they, rat, when they sit down, things kind of go away? Um, a lot of the, the, the neuropathies that are intrinsically from the foot we see actually get worse at night when somebody's trying to go to bed um, versus, you know, daytime when somebody's walking around, we see a lot more um, pain coming from, uh, that may be originating from the low back come into there. So a lot of it is about history. Do they the pain every time they touch their foot to the ground? Is it, you know, if their foot is elevated, are they still feeling pain or not? Um, so a lot of the, that um, question can be really be answered by just by looking at the patient's history and trying to tease out what is truly um, intrinsic from the foot versus what could be radiating from the, from the back or, or other uh, nerve impingements that they may have. Yeah, and, and I find that um, a lot of people when they're, uh, that, that nighttime that you're talking about, when, with the, especially with neuropathy, that they tend to have a lot of issues at nighttime. Um, and and I, I think for me, listening to what you're saying, one of the really important things for, the, for anybody watching at home who has these types of issues is to really take good notes about when it's bothering you and how it feels. I, I find that often people come into the office and I'm like, how does it feel? Well, like, it just hurts. I'm like, well... There's lots of things that mean hurt, you know, numbness, burning, tingling, shooting, pins and needles, it feels like they're walking on a cloud, there's a rock in their shoe, it feels like, even though there's not, there's a lot of descriptive symptoms, and, and sometimes if people say, you know, oh, it feels like a lightning shooting down the side of my leg, that really means something to us, even though it may not seem like it's that important to you. Uh, I 100% agree with you. I think it's really important. Um, people don't understand that a lot of times what we, a lot of what we do is pattern recognition. And we, we can recognize when a patient says, you know, oh, it's the first step that I take when I get off my bed and my foot is, is in so much pain. Like that means something to us. And I 100% agree. So keeping a pain journal is a very smart idea. Um, it, you know, uh, trying to, it allows us to kind of tease out different things. So I, I fully agree with that. Um, those descriptive words. Um, I'm just keeping a note what makes it feel better, what doesn't, medications that you may have tried that, that felt better versus um, things that just didn't touch it at all. We know if an anti-inflammatory touches, you know, works better for you than a nerve medication, now we're looking more musculoskeletal and joint than we're talking about nerve, pinched nerve and things like that. So um, that's definitely something that patients can arm themselves when coming to, um, to see their specialist as being very detailed and uh, supplying as much information um, as possible makes it much easier for us to do our, our job. So tell me more about pain journals. Um, I, I love this idea. I, you know, I, once in a while I'll tell people to write it down when they get home, but um, uh, this pain journal I like. What, what kind of things do you like people to put in there and what's important content? So, well, first, the, probably one of the most important things is I tell people, like, how, where to do it. So, a lot, you know, we, we walk around with these things all the time, right? This is your pain journal. This is literally stuck to your side all the time. Exactly. 
So putting it, jotting it down in a note, you know, and then putting the note somewhere and then losing that, it, it doesn't make sense. You have this thing right at your disposal all the time. So, um, and there's some apps that you can do too. To, um, I think some of them are actually called a pain journal um, that you can kind of download to help you that. But things that are of extremely importance is um, like uh, time, timing wise. So uh, making sure that you take it every day at the same time. So how do you feel at 7 a.m. right when you wake up at noon? right before lunch and, I, and and whatever times you choose just make sure it's consistent every time so that we have a really good like cause and uh, effect relationship that we can kind of build with that and I think another good thing is just the description of the pain you know again you know how intense does it feel um, if it's burning you know where is it burning does it decrease in one spot and go up in another spot uh, I think all that's pretty important to describe so another thing that I, I tend to see a lot in my practice, and uh, Dr. Dobb will be get a minute to comment in a second, would be how misaligned uh, feet affect people's back, back pain and, and nerve pain. So a lot of times if people are walking and they're walking unevenly, and, and there's a lot of different causes of this. It can be, you know, if your foot's flat and it's flattened out too much, it, it puts your a tilt to your ankle, which then puts a tilt to your knees and your hips and your back. Um, and then this can create symptoms in there. Other times people have had previous surgery, they have a hip replacement, knee replacement, and they may actually be physically shorter on one side because bone was taken out during that time. And so, you know, misaligned feet and, and misaligned uh, limbs can uh, then put different torques on the lower back affecting the nerves. So, um, uh, Dr. Dobb, I was just commenting uh, now that you're back about uh, kind of misaligned feet and how it affects the back. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so absolutely. That's, that's a big one that we see. Um, Dr. Mack, we um, frequently people miss the joints that can really be affected by um, by misaligned feet or knees, for instance, or hips. Um, we see a lot of sacroiliac joint dysfunction, um, and that's basically where your spine and your pelvis meet. Um, and when that is kind of off kilter and tilted, um, while it doesn't cause anything right away, but the kind of daily you know uh, motion and grind uh, leads to a lot of SI joint um, inflammation which then in turn into, goes into the low back and your lumbar facets. So um, again, a lot of times a frequent complaint, we, people will forget to tell us that they've had knee replacements or ankle uh, joint fusions and their predominant symptom, the presenting symptom is, is low back pain. Once you uh, tease out that history and figure out that it's actually, you know, either their gait is misaligned or something like that, then as you know, you're able to kind of fix that gait, um, whether through orthotics or surgery or whatever we need to do, and then a lot of times it's a domino effect where, hey, the knees feel better, the hips feel better, the low back feels better. Um, so these things, they take time to build up and, and um, create into a problem. And then the same side on that flip revert, once we fix the problem, it takes physical therapy, it takes some, um, some uh, manipulation to kind of get everything back in alignment. But we can see that once we're able to align the patient and get their gait straight and ambulating normally, a lot of these other symptoms will will fall in place. Yeah, I think for my standpoint, you know, we we often work with orthotics, like you had mentioned. The orthotics are a custom molded insert that goes into your shoe, and what it does is it lifts and supports your arch, controls motion at your heel. And um, you know, I have a lot of times where we get people in orthotics for a foot problem or an ankle problem, and next thing you know, my patient says, "Oh, my knee's feeling better, my back's feeling better," and yeah. so we're able to kind of start at the foundation because if the foundation's off, then then you're off completely. Um, and even some of these ones where we have limb length discrepancies, you know, something as simple as putting a lift in your shoe, um, either in the actual shoe or, or if it's a significant difference, we actually can uh, cut into the sole of the shoe and actually build up the shoe to even up your limb so that you're not off kilter. Um, and, and so all those things are, are helpful if they're recognized. So um, let's talk about um, let's talk about something called complex regional pain syndrome. Um, uh, this is something that um, you know I tend to see once in a blue moon in my practice, um, but it, it's pretty tragic when you see it with patients. Um, do you want to describe this a little bit more since you're probably better at explaining than me? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, complex regional pain uh, syndrome used to be called uh, RSD, and so it is a um, it is a unusual pain syndrome where um, usually following either like a traumatic traumatic effect um, event. Um, even surgery or any type of you know, infection that can be isolated to that area, um, amputation, something like that, where 
the nerves in the body um, start to kind of um, lose their processing ability. And so uh, there's a dysfunction in the nervous system where um, we see a lot of sympathetic changes that go on. So the nerves in the legs or for wherever the injury is clamp down, cause a lot of, um, a lot of symptoms of being cold and, and decreased blood flow, a lot of hypersensitive pain. So these patients just touching their skin and that'll make them want to jump, you know, um, jump off a roof basically. It's uh, an extremely, unfortunately, a very, very painful syndrome. Um, the biggest uh, thing and why, why it's very important to recognize this syndrome, um, it's based off of a criteria called the Budapest criteria. Um, so it's a very strict criteria uh, because it kind of used to be overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed, so they came up with a very strict criteria. But the important part with this syndrome is, um, is the time to diagnosis and that's what makes the biggest uh difference in outcome so you know it's not medications it's not um uh injections or surgeries or things like that but it's just the time of diagnosis because the biggest thing we can do for this is really good physical therapy and aggressive physical therapy because we need to retrain the brain on what is proper with this thing and so um typical things that we see with complex regional pain syndrome um so, you know in the extremity, we see it a lot in, in the feet, um, specifically after being in a boot or a cast for a, a couple months. The brain kind of loses its ability to process what is a right versus wrong um, uh, sensation in the foot. So we see a lot of swelling. Uh, we see a lot of uh, kind of what we call like purple patches uh, modeling where it almost looks like a road map. And that's because the, uh, the nerves and the, um, I'm sorry, the blood vessels have basically clamped down and the blood flow is now really bad and gives this kind of white purplish uh, appearance. Um, we see a lot of hypersensitivity to, to light touch, to moderate touch. Um, we see a lot of actually late stages, we can actually see the bones start to weaken there, uh, brittle nails, um, hair loss in those extremities. So really, unfortunately, a really terrible uh, syndrome. And luckily, if we're able to catch this thing um, early on though, um, you know, the outcomes become a much, much better. We're able to really get on top with physical therapy and medications. And so it's important to recognize these syndromes in a timely manner. And a lot of the times, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not the first one to, to recognize uh, these things or come across a lot of times these patients go to their primary care, do some physical therapy, um, you know, go see a, a foot and ankle specialist, and, and the diagnosis is just kind of missed and missed and missed. Um, where, you know, an acute cl clinician at any phase, really, if they recognize the syndrome, can, can have the best outcome for the patients. Okay. Um, and just so everybody knows, we are taking questions, so feel free to, to put your questions in and we can answer them live here for you. Um, so in my practice, um, I have a good number of patients who are diabetic um, and have neuropathy. Um, neuropathy being uh, abnormal feeling in their feet. For us, one of the big issues we run into is that people don't have good feeling in their feet and they may not feel if they're putting pressure too much somewhere. They get essentially like a blister and then it forms into what's called an ulceration or a wound on the bottom of their foot. And when that happens, then those get infected. And, and when you hear about diabetic amputations, this is something that's uh, you know very uh, tragic for people. But um, the other part of this that they have though is that you know neuropathy, some people have just kind of numbness where they don't feel their feet. Um, but other people have pain, and I have some patients who, um, you know, get burning, and, and it burns all day like their feet are on fire. I have other people where it feels like their feet are ringing, and they can't get to sleep at night. Um, and I, I typically start with medication and physical therapy and, um, you know, topical treatments for that. But, you know, when they get past that point, um, you know, what is what are other options that you have, Dr. Dava? Sure, yeah, that's... Uh, neuropathy, neuropathy is a tricky, tricky one. You know, um, the reason being is unlike um, larger pinched nerves from the low back or, or uh, you know, trauma to nerves and things like that. With neuropathy, we're talking about the small nerve fibers, right? And so there's millions, if not trillions, of them in, uh, throughout your foot and any other extremity. Um, so it's really hard. You can't really pinpoint and isolate a specific nerve and say, "I'm going to go in and and release this nerve or uh, put some numbing medicine on this uh, on this nerve." So we're kind of limited with a lot of the interventions that we can do. And then and then a lot of it falls on the type of neuropathy, like you were kind of insinuating. Um, you know, we see that with diabetic neuropathy, a lot of the times it tends to be a lot more painful, um, a lot of burning sensation, a lot of um, uh, nighttime discomfort where people that have just kind of uh, more or less genetic or idiopathic peripheral neuropathy um, 
they don't really have a reason to have neuropathy except for being genetic. And fortunately for them, we tend to see a plateau where the neuropathy gets, you know, mild to moderate, but doesn't actually ever get, you know, further severe or kind of continue to work its way up. Um, so obviously the, the first and foremost thing we do with treatment is just kind of obviously just rever if it's something reversible, we try to reverse. So if it's diabetic, we try to focus on, you know, glycemic control and, uh, and tighter, you know, working with the endocrinologist and getting that set up. Um, however, if we're going into treatments, you know, starting off medication wise, we're focusing on, on nerve medications. Now, there's the basic, you know, very standard um, calcium channel blockers like gabapentin and Lyrica that we're kind of all familiar with that we see on TV, and they're very, kind of very basic. But in the last um, year or two, there's actually been a lot more medication targeted specifically at diabetic neuropathy, um, one of them uh, being called Nucenta. Um, and I've had a lot of success with that medication. Uh, unfortunately, not, still not too many people know about it um, or are comfortable with it, but it is... A, uh, a medication that is more geared towards diabetic neuropathy. And so the, the outcomes we've seen with that have been tremendous uh, and very, very good. Um, other things that are kind of non-traditional um, treatments, um, we do do something called uh, ketamine and or lidocaine infusions, where this is an actual IV that goes in and, um, and you get an infusion that goes throughout the entire body and this is able to kind of soak in into all those nerves um, and calm them down so they're not so fiery and, and just very reactive. Um, and we've seen tremendous success with that. Um, in the more recent past, um, we've been using uh, traditional spinal cord stimulators, which, which has normally been more for um, kind of a sciatica type pain. Um, but recently with the changes in technology, we were able to do something called high frequency stimulation. Um, which has been really effective for diabetic neuropathies. Before these stimulators um, would cause, instead of pain, they would replace the sense of pain with a like uh, numbness or like with a uh, paresthesia, with tingling. Um, and we had tried using that a while ago on uh, diabetic neuropathy neuropathy cases, but patients didn't tolerate that tingling. That tingling actually made it much worse for them, and so we got away from that. But now with the newer technology, we, with the high frequency, there actually is no tingling sensation. We call it paresthesia free uh, stimulation um, and then we've been using that with our diabetic neuropathy uh, patients and it has been actually absolutely tremendous so without that feeling of paresthesia they're actually it, it's really doing what we wanted it to do and quieting the nerves there and blocking the pain signals for going to the brain um, and I think we're actually even close to an FDA labeling now for specifically for diabetic neuropathy, uh, which is going to be such a game changer for a lot of folks where everything else has traditionally failed them, um, and it can really be an option for them to kind of regain a lot of their life back. So when you're, when you're diagnosing neuropathy, um, you know, what are you typically doing to, to diagnose for neuropathy? So we take a, you know, thorough history, um, you know, have they had, you know, um, do they have diabetes? Do, you know, have they had chemo? There's chemo-induced neuropathy. We have things such as alcohol-induced neuropathy. So they have had a heavy drinking history in the past. Um, or, you know, uh, idiopathic neuropathy, meaning has their family members all gotten this, and now they got this for no explained reason. Um, doing a physical exam, obviously, so checking to see what their reflexes look. We can t tell a lot by which nerves are being affected. Is this their motor, their ability to walk? Is this their sensation, proprioception, which is their ability to tell where they're, where they are in, in kind of spatial arrangement, or is this a complete sensory? Um, and then if we're kind of a little maybe unsure, or we just kind of want to rate how bad it is, we do something called an EMG test. Um, and the EMG test um, is basically reading the conduction of through the nerves, the small fibers and the large fibers, going all the way from the back down to the to the toes, um, and we're able to kind of read how fast the nerves are going compared compared to them what to normal speeds and then figure out which nerves are affected and how so and that's usually able to confirm the diagnosis for us and i found those to be the uh, the emg uh, ncv test to be very helpful for people to find this uh, another thing we're doing in our office too now is the uh, uh, epidermal nerve biopsies um and it's uh i don't know if you guys are doing those right now but um no. we'll take a little punch biopsy, the three millimeter little piece of skin we take just kind of right off the lower leg. And uh, what we can do is we can get a value of, of how many nerves are present in that area. And normal is like seven to 14. 
And some patients come in and, you know, they have like six and a half nerves in that field when they look at it under a microscope. And we know they just have some mild neuropathy. Um, and then some patients, you know, we get in there, there's no nerve fibers there. And we know that they're very significant in, in those types of changes. And I mean, personally, I use that to kind of decide how much medication to start people on. Because if, if you're completely devoid of nerve fibers and I put you on 100 milligrams of gabapentin, you know, it, it's not going to touch you. And so I use that to kind of test that. And then it's something that you can actually follow up and, and do, you know, a year or two later and see how progressive this is and check to see kind of are the nerves dipping down. So it's a nice little quick, easy test that we do in the office also um, that I think is a good complement to the, to the nerve conduction. Do you, have, do you have to send that to pathology and then they read it for you? Yeah, we send that to a pathologist and uh, there's certain labs that do these. Um, and, and the nice thing is that you can, you can do them bilaterally. You can do them on each leg and kind of compare the two. And for me, you know, sometimes if, uh, you know, if we don't have access to, you know, doing the EMG right away, especially now with, with COVID and, and having, you know, decreased resources at the hospital and at people's offices, yeah. you know, this is something you can do on each side. And if you see a significant difference from one side to the other, you know, you can say, well, this may not be a, a, a systematic neuropathy type of issue. It might be something that's more localized and a localized compression syndrome or an issue like that. So will you see changes like that with like, say, like a tarsal tunnel compression? Um, and, and then where do you, so where do you take the bias? I mean, can you take it where you suspect their pain? Do you take above or below that ligament or how do you? What they have is they have, they have standards and it's about eight millimeters or eight centimeters above the, the tip of the lateral malleolus. And uh, so you take it from there and they have a, a, a range that is normal for that area. So, you know, I use this more for, for diagnosing uh, systemic neuropathy issues. You know, and I've had some patients where, you know, you do the biopsy and the nerves look pretty normal. Um, and I'm like, well, it's not something down here. It must be something higher up in the back, you know, and that's when I send them out for, for a referral so that that can be evaluated. And, and that's when like an EMG is very helpful to say, yeah, this is a more of a large fiber neuropathy versus a small fiber neuropathy because the epidermal nerve biopsies only pick up small fiber. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah. The, you know, it, it's wonderful when we get new tools like this that are able to kind of help expedite diagnosis and things like that. And especially that we're able to do a lot of these things in the outpatient setting now, because I've been noticing that a lot. I mean, I think we're going to, a lot of patients are just very uncomfortable now going to hospitals to get any type of th these procedures or tests done. So the fact that these are now easily um, accessible procedures that we can do in the office and get results uh, probably even quicker now than hospitals because of their backlog of their pathologists and radiologists. So um, it's an excellent uh, resource now that we are able to provide the patients on uh, in an in office setting like this. Well, and it's great because you know with this type of stuff, then you can you can get a telehealth visit. I'm sure you guys are doing those too. You know where the patients can talk to us via computer, kind of like we're talking now. And then we can go over results and I can call a medication for them and, and we can start them going on that, um, you know, versus getting a test at a hospital and waiting weeks to get it back and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Sure, yeah. And I think, I mean, you know, the, the virtual, the telemedicine stuff, you know, well, it does have some, some limitations, but I think especially for, for this time being like this or, or for patients that live in a rural area that don't have access to specialists like yourself, like that's going to be a huge game changer for them to be able to, to seek that care. And, you know, I, I've had a lot of patients, you know, whenever they used to come for a visit, it was a 250-mile drive each way, um, you know, and, and, and it wasn't always necessary, you know. Um, a lot of times it's just to go over results or go over the next step or things like that that we're able to do this. So I think this is wonderful and it's going to have a, a big uh, place in medicine for us, but um, it's going to be it's gonna be a game changer. Well, and hopefully this is something, you know, it's being covered now by the insurance companies because of the COVID crisis, but it'd be nice if long-term this is something that's a good option for our patients. And, you know, I've got patients who, you know, their, you know, daughter has to take off work to drag, you know, mom in to come in and she's 90, you know, just for something that, that could be kind of worked through in this sort of setting. So yeah, I agree. I definitely am a little fearful about that to see, you know, that, that, that won't be the case, but, I, you know, maybe if, uh, if enough people kind of voice their opinions and go through, it might be really nice. Um, being in the Midwest, also, hey, there are some days you're under six feet of snow, so it would be nice to be able to keep those uh, patient visits going. Yeah. Well, we've got a question here uh, from Christina Arena. It says, how long does it take to get in for an appointment for both offices? Um, well, I'll speak for my office. Uh, you know, new patients, we try to get in uh, same day or the next day, um, especially if it's something that's urgent. Um, we have nine offices and uh, 13 doctors working for us. So we're able to accommodate uh, appointments pretty easily. 
Um, you know, if it's something that's chronic that, you know, can wait a day or two, you know, we get you in a day or two. If you have a broken bone, if you have an infection, if you have something that's really painful, obviously we want to get you in the same day. How about, how about you at your office? Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, I just wanted to kind of just, just touch base on that and, and applaud you guys. I remember I had a patient that was here for a new visit a couple of weeks ago, um, and it was for her sciatica. And she ended up actually having a, a diagnosed fracture. Um, that same day that she was coming, we were able to get her in like within an hour or two into an appointment with you. So um, I want to thank you a lot for that, and that, that means a lot to these patients that you're able to accommodate so quickly. Um, and we do the same is the the same uh, same way. You know, a lot of patients, you know, pain is um, it is it is not a pleasant thing for people to be in, and uh, we we understand that, and we're very um, empathetic with that. So a lot of the times for a new patient, we will work our hardest to get them within, you know, in the doors within the first 48 hours. Um, and even then, once we, you know, we partner with, with uh, resources and other groups like yourself that, that try to move things along very quickly so that patients are, you know, it, it's difficult when they have to wait three, four weeks for an MRI and then come back another month to get in. So we, we're very um, quick with our patients. So we like to get the MRIs. We'll help them set them up, you know, if they need an MRI or to see a specialist, somebody that can get them in within 48 hours as well and then get them back into our office to do whatever we need to do. So, um, yeah, it yeah. was generally 48 hours to get in uh, new patients. Well, and I think it's important for some of these conditions especially, you know, to, to get people in in a, in a quick fashion because, you know, the patient you sent over to me, you know, if they have a fracture, that's something that needs to be addressed right away. If you walk around on that, you may, it might be a fracture that's perfectly fine in a cast, and you wind up may wind up needing surgery because you were on it too much. And, you know, especially with, it's also, you know, when they're in severe pain and, and you know, especially like complex regional pain syndrome, like we were talking earlier, it's important to get in in an expeditious fashion. Yeah. Well, a lot of people, I mean, you know, it, not only is it just the pain, but it's a lot of people have to, you know, the patients have to go to work. They have to support their families, especially in a time like this. They have to put food on the table and they can't afford to be off, you know, a week or two trying to get into a doctor's office just to get rid of their, you know, to help them with their sciatic pain. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the the standard needs to be better. And, and, and this is, you know, I know this is how we run our office, but I think a lot of people unfortunately don't have that same experience in other places. Um, and, and this is, needs to be done because, you know, patients need to, we need to take care of them. They need to get, you know, their care quickly. And again, probably a benefit of, of being outside of the hospitals. I think things in our offices move a little faster than they typically do. If you pick up the phone and call a, a, your local major hospital, it, it takes a little longer to get things moving there. Sure does. Um, so I got a question for you. Um, we deal with uh, foot drop a lot, you know, in patients where they've had a stroke, they've had injury, they've had uh, lower back problems that have gotten severe enough. Um, you know, in our office, uh, a lot of what we're doing with, with foot drop is we're working with bracing and we have a lot of new carbon fiber type braces that help spring people forward and help clear their foot off the ground. Um, and then, um, you know, we also run into situations where when you have some patients and, and they have one muscle that's not doing really well, you can actually take a, a different muscle and tendon and move it to a different part of the foot to help pull their foot up. Um, it's called a tendon transfer. Um, and, and so we, we work a lot with helping people that get that and then working with therapy and rehab to get them there. Um, can you kind of go through your algorithm of how you diagnose foot drop and, and you know, what you think some of the main causes are? Absolutely. So, yeah, I was actually astonished when I found out that that was a treatment that was available to patients because a, a lot of the times when we diagnose foot drop, um, unfortunately, the the usual answer to that was, well, you got to go back and see the surgeon that, you know, that did the, you know, that um, did the procedure yet that may have caused that. Or if you've had an injury, a lot of times there really wasn't a great treatment for that. So that's excellent that you guys are doing that. Um, the way that I kind of work up foot drop is, again, we take a thorough history of the patient. You know, did they have a recent surgery? Have they had crush injuries? Are they, um, are they at that, you know, do they have neuropathy for some reason? Um, doing, doing our physical and seeing it, trying to just, cipher out which muscle it is or tendon or, or that is actually, um, you know, causing the actual issue. Um, we do get concerned about, um, about MS being a potential cause of that. So a lot of times I'll order um, some pretty extensive imaging, um, looking at, you know, the brain, the spinal cord, um, making sure that they don't have something else, some intrinsic in the spinal cord deficit that may be causing their foot drop. Um, a lot of times we'll run that EMG test to see again, um, can we pinpoint exactly what 
the um, the specific nerve that is causing the or, or muscle that is causing the deficit to occur. Um, but you know, a lot of the times, once we get to that diagnosis, the treatment becomes the obstacle, and it's okay. Well, how exactly do we treat this now um, without having to go necessarily under the knife to a, another major surgery in hopes that we may or may not be successful in, in maybe alleviating a little pressure off of a nerve or something? So um, that's that's how we I kind of you go through my algorithm. Um, but again, the, the biggest thing is ruling out, you know, any major ongoing systemic disease that, that might be causing that. And then if we're able to pinpoint the exact muscle or, or nerve, figuring out what the treatment is. Yeah. And I've seen, you know, I've seen people do really well, um, you know, with, like I said, with different types of bracing and, and good with rehab. And, and, you know, a lot of times when people, uh, you know, sometimes people have like a stroke and, and, you know, they can recover from some of this foot drop and some of these other nerve problems. You know, some of these other conditions, uh, or if you have a severe stroke, sometimes they may not be. But there's a lot of ways you can kind of work with this. And, um, you know, from a rehab standpoint, bracing standpoint, and, and sometimes there's little small surgical procedures that can really change people's lives. Excellent. So now I think it's my, my turn to ask you a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, your input a little bit. Um, so I have a lot of, uh, part of our practice is rheumatology. So I have a lot of patients that have rheumatoid arthritis. And one of the things we start seeing is um, these these deformities in the foot, you know, um, and while some of them try to do a good job of keeping their hygiene clean and, and everything, I always try to encourage them, um, you know, to go see a specialist like yourself for kind of good foot hygiene and care. So can you run me down through kind of what you do with those patients and how you, um, how you handle that? Yeah, so with uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, my mom has rheumatoid arthritis and, and you know, I have an aunt with the, has had it before too and, and a few family members. So, um, so it's something that hits very close to my heart. Um, you know, with rheumatoid arthritis, you know, the, the first thing I like to do is, is to get x-rays of people's feet and, and kind of take a history because often with rheumatoid arthritis, like you know, it, it may not be just rheumatoid arthritis. There may be other conditions laced in there in the rheumatological families. And so I like to get a good history of, of you know, what other types of labs have been done and what other diagnosis they have on top of that. Um, once we do that, we get x-rays and we can check out different deformities. Now, Rheumatoid arthritis has a very typical pattern of what happens to people's feet. They develop hammer toes where the toes start clawing up. Um, the fat pad in their foot, which is normally kind of at the ball of the foot, can actually shift forward. And that exposes the, the ball of the foot, the bones called the metatarsals to the ground. Um, and it'll, often it'll start feeling like people are walking on rocks because they don't have any padding underneath there. Um, and then uh, people, their foot can flatten out and they can have tendon and, and joint uh, destruction over time too. Um, so what we tend to do for these patients, um, you know, uh, number one is we like to get them in what called, what's called an orthotic. And, and we use a different type of orthotic for this versus what I put in like a marathon runner. Um, they're very cushioned. They're very soft. Um, there's ways we can take pressure off that ball of foot and shift it to other areas of the foot that can take it. Um, and, and the nice thing about it is that rheumatolo uh, rheumato rheumatoid arthritis is a um, progressive disease. And so their foot changes over time. But with certain types of orthotics, you can make different adjustments over time. And so um, then, uh, you know, over time, you know, people can lose stability in the joints. And uh, sometimes it does become a surgical problem. Um, and, and there's a, a rheumatoid reconstruction procedure where the toes are put back straight and um, the bones that are on the ball of the foot um, are, um, are fixed so that they don't put all that pressure at the bottom of the foot. And, and it really can make a big difference for people um, as far as fitting and shoe gear and, and actually walking. Excellent. Excellent. So it looks like we have another question here from Amanda Eckhart, if I'm pronouncing that right. And it says, do you do stem cell therapy? Do you want to touch on that first? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just stem cell therapy has definitely been something that, uh, that we've been specializing in, regenerative medicine. Um, I tell people, you know, um, people generally say stem cell therapy, but that's an actual pretty big spectrum. So stem cell therapy kind of includes everything from um, prolotherapy, PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, and then um, different types of stem cells, which can be anywhere from amniotic to adipose to bone marrow stem cells. Um, and we, read, we use those for a variety of reasons, um, depending on exactly what we're trying to do and how far along somebody's progression is. So where we've seen the best outcomes with um, stem cells is a lot of times, especially related to joints, um, anybody that's showing mild to moderate amount of degenerative changes, um, decrease in synovial fluid, uh, deterioration of cartilage, 
um, is where we're seeing the best and most effective um, results with those. Unfortunately, you know, stem cell therapies is still in its infancy and there's still a lot that we need to learn about it. So I think we're only starting to, you know, just scratch the surface of what we're going to be able to do with stem cells. Um, but right now, when we start talking about somebody that has severe, very, very advanced degeneration in their joints, unfortunately, the stem cells are not doing as much as we would like them to do. So it's really important that, you know, um, that a physician kind of evaluate, that we're able to evaluate and see exactly where you are in the stage of, you know, either degeneration or, um, or uh, bone loss and things like that, that we can see exactly how much improvement we can do. Um, but where stem cells um, has been successful for us, I would say about 70% of our patients with the right patient selection have had extremely positive results going on. You know, at this stage, we're going on three, four years um, with absolute success and not having to really um, redo them. Now, the stem cells, we're also, you know, we're not stopping the aging process, right? And so they are unfortunately permanent fixes, um, but they're definitely very, very long lasting fixes where, where we're seeing excellent results for, you know, for many, many years. Um, and I think that we're just going to see more and more as we're able to do more and learn more about stem cells. Well, I think that we've seen, you know, that there's a lot of different products and procedures and different ways to do things. And, you know, I, I, I think this, uh, this category is, is a wonderful category. Uh, I just, I think our, our viewers have to be careful because there are people out there who, you know, uh, are doing one kind of therapy and they're selling it for 5,000 bucks a shot. And they're, you know, really pushing hard on, on this and saying it's going to fix everything. And, and, you know, I want people to know that it's, it's you know, while this can be very helpful, it's not an, always an end all for everybody. And that, you know, you need to really be careful. And, and there's, um, there's lots of different treatments. And, and, you know, when someone's only pushing one therapy all the time and they have one, one trick and, and don't have other options for you, sometimes people, uh, you know, get predatory with these types of treatments. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Dr. Mack. I mean, it breaks my heart when I, you know, have, um, you know, elderly patients that came in, you know, they, they took $10,000 loans to get these stem cells that were supposed to, you know, that the doctor promised would help with their back pain. And looking at the results and what they did, you know, I could have told you that this was never going to work, you know. And so, unfortunately, there are people taking advantage of, of, you know, of really desperate people that are looking for any type of pain relief or improvement in their quality of life. Um, so it's extremely important. I 100% agree, you know, really, you know, you, you need to know who you're going to. Um, you know, if they're a clinic that only does stem cells, you know, and you walk in that door, well, guess what? They're going to put stem cells on you. Right. Right. At that day, they're going to tell you, no, stem cells are going to help. And, and you know, the odds are you're never going to see them again anyway. So if it doesn't help, it, you know, they're kind of, you know, indifferent about it. Um, but really, you know, make sure you're going to somebody that has a good reputation that's really looking out for your best interest. Because, you know, I can tell you for every, for every stem cell case I do, I'm telling about five six people that they're not candidates for it. Right. And I, I think that's important, you know, anywhere you go where they're giving you a free chicken dinner to listen to to listen to a lecture about stem cells is, is you know, one of the ones that you probably don't want to work with. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So um, we've been going for almost 45 minutes now. Um, why don't we uh, as we wind down this, why don't you can you just give me kind of one tip that you have for your patients and what you think would be uh, something that they should know? Um, so. I would say with my patients, you know, um, a lot of the times with pain syndromes, um, you know, getting treatment sooner rather than later is is not only more beneficial to you, but more beneficial to me as well. In terms of, it's much harder to treat conditions when they've been going on for 10, 15, 20 plus years. You know, don't be Mr. or Mrs. Tough Guy waiting till your pain's a 9 out of 10 every day of the week and your quality of life is disrupted. Come in earlier. The earlier you, you seek treatment, the easier it is for me to do my job and be able to um, to find a treatment that works for you. Um, and it's just, you know, you're, otherwise you're just putting yourself through like unnecessary suffering. There's usually always an, another option. Um, I don't ever want people to feel discouraged and be like, everyone's, somebody's skipping up on me. There's nothing left, left I can do. I can't tell you the last time I told a patient that there's nothing left to try or do. There's always something to try. And uh, my, my, my tip, I was kind of going to have to piggyback on yours now. You know, mine is that, that foot pain's not normal. You know, I have a lot of patients that come in and say, oh, you know, like uh, they'll come in and say, yeah, you know, my, I have this ingrown toenail, it's killing me. And I'll be like, is anything else going on? It's like, well, my feet always hurt. You know, that's, that's just, your feet are supposed to hurt at the end of the day. And I go, no, they're not. 
You know, your feet aren't supposed to be painful. And so, um, you know, foot pain is not normal. There's a lot of things that can be done for foot pain um, to, you know, whether it's changes in your gait, whether it's, you know, orthotics for your shoes, whether it's, um, you know, other types of, of therapies that, that can be very successful. And so, you know, uh, where I'm piggybacking off is, is that, you know, if you're having a problem, you should come in. You shouldn't just sit with it and wonder, waiting for it to get worse. You know, I always, whenever I talk to patients, one of the things I'll say, well, what have you been doing for this besides trying to ignore it? And they always laugh because they have been doing that for so long. And so, you know, I think when you see a problem that's, that's been going on, especially if it's been going on for a week or so, and it's not getting better, and you don't know why, you need to come in and get seen. Absolutely. So. Well, it's great talking to you today. We got to do this in person when we're allowed to, to go back out again. Yes, I agree. I'm, I'm counting down the days, hopefully. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's great that we're able to do this, um, you know, at least having some type of interaction. But um, I, I will say I, I definitely miss, uh, you know, seeing your face in person. Well, you know, if anybody's looking to get a hold of us, um, again, I'm Dr. Patrick McEnany. Uh, our website is IllinoisFoot.com, um, and that's something that can you can find our information on. Our phone number is 847-639-5800. Um, and, and we see any type of uh, foot and ankle problem, even things in the leg, basically anything below the knee. So, um, and Dr. David, do you want to give information on your practice? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it was really a great event. I think very educational for both of us. Um, <laughs> Our, ther our practice is Pain Therapy Associates. We're located in Schaumburg. Uh, we treat all types of pain syndromes, anywhere from, from uh, you know, migraines, back pain, low neck pain, shoulder pain, uh, basically anything uh, pain-related, rheumatology we take care of. So if, you, if you're ever unsure of anything, um, if we treat something, you can always give our office a call or email us. Visit our website, painhealth.com, um, and we're happy to see what we can do for you. Great. Well, it was wonderful talking to you. All right, you take care, buddy. All right, be safe. All right. You too.